at these clouds. Oh my god! We're gonna get hit on our feet! These are footage from Joplin that had minutes of warning because nothing looked wrong. No one thought it was that serious until it was too late. When a rain-wrapped tornado reached full strength and erased half the city before many understood what was happening. A high precipitation supercell, so that means you're not going to be able to see a tornado if there in fact is one on the ground right now. The day ended with silence and debris. Whole blocks flattened, steel twisted into ribbons, power flashes pulsing along the horizon. Shortly after 5.34 p.m. on May 22, 2011, an EF5 tornado struck Joplin, Missouri. In less than an hour, it killed 158 people, injured more than 1,000, and caused nearly $2.9 billion in losses, which made it the costliest single tornado in U.S. history. The storm left a scar nearly six miles long and more than a mile wide, with winds exceeding 200 miles per hour. And no one saw it coming. Earlier that afternoon, the city looked ordinary. Joplin High School was filled with caps and gowns. Families posed for photos, unaware that a powerful supercell was tightening 50 miles to the west. The air felt heavy. Temperatures near 80 degrees Fahrenheit, dew points in the upper 60. A typical May setup until it wasn't. At 5.09 p.m., the first siren sounded. Residents paused, checked the sky, then went back to dinner and errands. Tornado sirens were common in southwest Missouri. 25 minutes later, a second warning arrived. The storm's circulation had dropped south of Galena, Kansas, and was rolling toward Joplin. It was a high precipitation supercell, meaning its tornado would be hidden by curtains of rain. Inside the KSN television studio on the city's west side, meteorologists fought static and flickering monitors. One of them finally shouted the last clear message before the feed went dark. When I'm just looking out the door right now, please do not go outside and try to track this storm, folks. You can't see anything outside. It is rain ramp. This is a dangerous, dangerous situation. Yeah, take shelter immediately, folks. Uh, if you can hear us, if we are still able to broadcast, you need We're to take shelter if you are in western it. Joplin at this point in time. Yet. Please continue to. Just in case it cuts back on. All right, we're off air. Outside, the first debris began to fall like hailstones, and the horizon disappeared. Meteorologists would later call it a textbook setup with tragic timing. Four ingredients had aligned. Moisture, instability, lift, and wind shear. Gulf air surged northward. Daytime heat made it buoyant. A boundary supplied lift, and upper-level winds twisted the column into rotation. The result was a supercell whose tornado was wrapped in rain, invisible to everyone in its path. A rain-wrapped tornado steals seconds. You can't see its outline. Only power flashes as transformers explode. The sound arrives first, low and resonant, followed by air that moves the wrong direction through every gap in the house. Warnings existed, but human behavior lagged behind the threat. Many waited for visual confirmation that never came. By the time residents recognized danger, the EF5 circulation was already entering the southwest neighborhoods. At 5.34 p.m., the funnel touched down near J.J. and 32nd Street on Joplin Southwest Edge. Within two minutes, it broadened into a mile-wide wedge. Trees snapped at their trunks. Roofs lifted cleanly from houses. The air pressure fell so sharply that ears popped and walls flexed. In one subdivision, every home on the block vanished, leaving only concrete pads and driveways. Video from Storm Chasers shows the tornado advancing as a solid gray mass. Visibility was non-existent. Residents could hear debris slamming against walls before realizing the tornado was on top of them. That is a tornado, people. Oh, sweet Jesus, keep me safe. Keep me safe, Lord. Keep me safe. Sweet Lord, keep that to my south, Lord. Keep my wife safe, she's over there, Lord. Moments later, his neighborhood ceased to exist. The tornado, now a full EF5, accelerated toward the city's dense core, toward St. John's Regional Medical Center and Rangeline Road. 
The hospital in the hardest minutes. St. John's Regional Medical Center stood directly in the tornado's path. Its windows faced southwest, the direction from which the storm arrived. At 5.41 p.m., pressure inside the building dropped. Glass imploded and ceiling tiles rained down. The backup generators faltered when power lines severed. Ventilators stopped. Medical staff shielded patients with their own bodies. Five patients died when machines lost power. Dozens more were injured. Across the street, homes disintegrated in seconds. The Greenbrier Nursing Home sustained catastrophic losses, about 20 fatalities in one strike. Investigators later traced the structural failures. Light frame walls, unsecured roofs, and windows without impact protection. Those lessons would reshape hospital design across the region. For Joplin's emergency system, this was the breaking point. Communications cut. Hospitals offline, responders scattered through rubble. From the hospital, the tornado moved east across Rangeline Road, Joplin's main commercial artery. Restaurants, retailers, and big box stores filled both sides. At the time, the wedge was at a peak width about a mile. Traffic signals still operated for a moment, trapping cars in intersections. In a matter of seconds, visibility vanished and entire parking lots were lifted. Inside businesses, employees acted on instinct. In a pizza shop, the manager pulled people into a freezer and held the door closed with a bungee cord. At a cell phone store, a worker braced a bathroom latch while the roof peeled away. In Home Depot and Walmart, staff shouted over the roar, hurting customers to interior walls that soon cracked but didn't collapse. A driver caught near a traffic light described the chaos later. So you would go up and then you would drop. The way that your stomach sinks and drops and that jerking of side to side motion is the only way I know how to describe it. And when it stopped, that's whenever it set in like, oh my gosh, I was just in a tornado. When the wind finally released, range line looked like an aerial photograph of war. Concrete slabs where entire stores had stood 10 minutes earlier. As the tornado crossed Interstate 44 and lifted around 6.12 p.m., rain continued to fall through a haze of dust. The smell of splintered wood and gas leaks filled the air. Power was gone across most of the city. Fire crews and police worked by flashlight. Volunteers arrived barefoot, climbing over twisted beams. Search teams marked houses with orange X's. One quadrant for hazards, one for victims, one for status. The human toll was staggering. 158 fatalities. 1,150 injuries. 8,000 homes damaged, 4,000 destroyed, and roughly $2.8 to $2.9 billion in total losses. Entire families were missing. Temporary triage centers formed in parking lots. Mercy Hospital in Springfield dispatched ambulances to carry the most critical survivors. In the days that follow, another silent threat appeared. Mercormaciosis, a rare fungal infection spread through contaminated debris wounds. Thirteen confirmed cases, five deaths. A grim reminder that disaster lingers even after the sky clears. What changed and what remains? Recovery began before sunrise. Volunteers poured in from nearby states. The Missouri National Guard arrived within hours. Federal agencies set up mobile command posts, while locals searched street by street. But rebuilding Joplin required more than manpower. Engineers from NIST and NOAA documented every failure, how pressure differentials shattered walls, how critical facilities lost power, and how warnings failed to prompt action. Their findings led to permanent changes. Hospitals rebuilt with hardened cores, redundant systems, and impact-rated glass. Schools integrated safe rooms able to withstand 250-mile-per-hour winds. Building codes in Missouri and Kansas were strengthened for roof anchoring and debris protection. Weather service offices introduced impact-based warnings, replacing generic alerts with plain language messages about destruction and fatalities. The cultural recovery followed slower. For months, temporary housing dotted the city. Memorials appeared at 26th and Main, at Cunningham Park and near the rebuilt high school. 
The butterfly people stories, children recalling glowing figures who shielded them, became part of the city's shared folklore. In the weeks after the tornado, dozens of children described seeing butterfly people hovering above the wreckage. Radiant, winged figures who seemed to block the wind or lift them out of danger. One plaque downtown even preserves those memories. I remember on this shoulder, a hand touched me like right here, and they told me everything was going to be okay. It's actually really weird, but ever since then, I'll be walking outside and a butterfly will come and land on me. Some residents believe the butterfly people were guardian angels. Others see them as the mind's instinctive mercy, a vision born of faith and trauma in a town steeped in both. But whatever their origin, the legend becomes a symbol of healing. Today, Joplin's skyline is different. Buildings are lower, safer, anchored deeper. Streets, once unrecognizable, are lined again with homes and trees. The scars remain visible from the air, but they're also instructive. Proof that even after the deadliest U.S. tornado in 70 years, lessons can outlast tragedy. Joplin rebuilt not just its walls, but its warning systems, its hospitals, and its sense of readiness. When the next storm siren rises, those memories will answer first, quietly, firmly, reminding everyone that preparation is what turns survival into recovery.